Good evening. It is Wednesday, June the 22nd, 2022 at 7 p.m. Arizona time. Stop the screen share here. My name is Jay Carpenter. I'm the founder of Desert Blockchain, and this is our monthly session. For those of you that not, might not be familiar with the, the uh, format for Desert Blockchain, but um, we have these monthly sessions. We cover various topics on uh, the fourth Wednesday of the month, and this will go for about an hour. And tonight we're going to be talking about um, decentralized constructs versus centralized constructs for um, a variety of interesting topics, primarily on um, addressing and identity, decentralized identity. And we'll be looking at this using a model of a camp that's coming up called uh, D Web Camp 2022, which will be happening August the 24th through the 28th in Mendocino, the Mendocino, California area. We'll be using the camp grounds and so forth as kind of a model to look at some, what I consider to be some of the most fundamental issues remaining for decentralized constructs to be come uh, not only mainstream, but actually uh, operational. So um, thank you for joining. If you're joining via the YouTube live stream, I am following the comments. Uh, so please type your comments in the box to the right. And if you are a Desert Blockchain citizen, then you're invited to join on the Zoom um, live uh, connection. And if you're not a Desert Blockchain citizen, we invite you to become one for $10 a month via Patreon. And you can find links in the recording below and also on Twitter and so forth. So um, any questions, uh, Gary, before we get started or Michelle, I know you're on and I'm delighted. Uh, Professor Marchant is on, who is, um, holds, who's basically the organizer of the GETS, the Governance of Emerging Technology and Science Conference that happened on May 19th and 20th at Arizona State University College of Law. And um, also I, I attended the Dispute Resolution Conference that was earlier before GETS and I'll be sharing some comments regarding uh, some of my conversations with some of the scholars at the dispute resolution conference regarding Coase theorem and so forth. So we'll weave that in. And Michelle, who hasn't spoken yet, is attending Desert, or excuse me, um, DWeb Camp in um, late August. So I'm delighted that both of you are part of the conversation this evening. So. Um, let me go ahead and do a little screen share and I will go into the presentation. Hopefully you can see that. So, so we are going to use the D-Web Camp as a, a model for assigning identities, assigning assets, and considering dispute resolution and kind of comparing and contrasting how it generally has worked in the past with centralized constructs and how it might work in the future with decentralized constructs primarily using the work of the fellow on the right, who is um, Professor Ronald Coase, who taught at the University of Chicago and was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1991 for his work on um, what's been termed Coase theorem, which is a way to uh, settled dispute resolutions, as well as assignment of property rights and, and so forth in a very decentralized way. I won't go into that um, <clears throat> totally at this point, but 
Um, that is what we're talking about. And in the middle of the images, you can see a map of Camp Navarro where DWeb Camp 2022 will happen. And to the left, you see under centralized is Wendy Hanamura of the Internet Archive, who is basically um, the organizer of DWeb Camp. And um, I love Wendy. There's nothing um, uh, to, to cast uh, shade on Wendy on this. Uh, and she did agree to that I could use her image to represent centralized uh, constructs here. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with centralized constructs. They're just different than decentralized constructs in what we're trying to create here in terms of some really, really critical elements in my view that are missing in the decentralized web or D-Web or Web3 constructs. So that's what we're talking about tonight. And basically, although I'm calling this a D-Web camp directory, what I'm really talking about is a Swiss neutral global public key directory, a cryptogra cryptography construct called the public key. And what if we had a, a global public key directory that was the source of truth and authenticity and um, trust basically that we could rely upon and use that as sort of our foundation for creating security, creating direction, creating uh, sources of data and many, many other uh, constructs, including decentralized identity. And <clears throat> I'll talk about this in a little bit more as we go through the presentation, but I consider the, this to be probably the most important piece for uh, decentralized constructs like blockchain and so forth to um, actually uh, work. And, and actually become mainstream and uh, fulfill some of the promise that they have been um, looked upon to deliver. So um, we'll talk about centralized authorities, how they've worked in the past, and we'll talk about these decentralized authorities in terms of dispute resolution, asset allocation in the context of Ronald Coase's theorem or Coase's theorem, and we'll kind of map that on to the D-Web uh, campsite, and I'll, I'll draw some <clears throat> parallels and analogies and so forth. And then we'll talk a little bit about why haven't we cracked this nut, because um, <clears throat> some of the biggest enterprises, biggest institutions in the world have been trying to figure out um, identity, decentralized identity, and how to implement it. And in my view, it has not succeeded. And it's, it's a critical factor in, in multiple dimensions. And there have been initiatives like the Web of Trust and also trying to build this on a foundation of attestation. I think both of those are flawed. And I have a presentation to talk about that. Um, and we can look at how a different model that's more of a property rights model and more of an adversarial way to um, sort through who should be or who is the highest and best user of a particular asset or um, the, the winner of uh, dispute resolutions in terms of various uh, conflicts and so forth. But anyway, we'll talk about that uh, as we go on. And then I'm, I've also included a presentation that I did uh, many years ago called the End User Identity Paradox. So that's basically what we're planning to cover tonight. And I would like to say that um, this is a, camp, a map of Camp Navarro where there should be approximately, uh, it's estimated it'll be between 500 and 700 participants in August. And part of the reason that I'm doing this, um, this presentation tonight is to sort of put the conversation out there on the table 
for the DWeb camp participants to consider and something that we might um, talk about and collaborate upon when we gather uh, for the five days, I believe it's five days in late August at uh, DWeb camp 2022. So that, um, and I have submitted a proposed workshop on this topic, and this is kind of a, an initial step at creating this conversation, because um, I consider the people that are going to DWeb Camp to be some of the brightest, most innovative, most uh, technically knowledgeable people in the world that are really creating what is next for um, Web3 and DWeb and um, just a whole new empowerment of human being in the world um, as, as we move forward over the next uh, five to 10 years. So this is Wendy. And if you don't know Wendy Hanamura, she has organized all the, the D-Web summits and the D-Web, the first D-Web camp that happened in 2019 in July. It was about 500 of, uh, again, some of the most innovative, creative people uh, that I've ever met, and also some of the people that actually invented Web 1 and 2, folks like Tim Berners-Lee and uh, Brewster Kale and, you know, other luminaries, uh, Mitchell Baker, the, um, the chairman of the Mozilla Foundation and so forth. And, you can, you can check on the DWeb camp. Um, it's dwebcamp.org is the link. You can check and see the links down at the bottom for uh, links to the prior events that Wendy basically um, organized. And she put a ton of time and basically poured her heart and soul into these events. But I am using Wendy as sort of our conventional um, arbiter of uh, what what works, what doesn't work, how things go, and so forth. And and believe me, Wendy is um, completely dedicated to seeing a world that is decentralized. However, as the organizer of the D Web summits and the D Web camp, um, Wendy and her her crew, her staff, and she's got a, an impressive staff that works on these events, um, they sort of acted in a, um, what, what I'm choosing to represent as a centralized construct where, you know, um, they, they effectively were the ones who um, had the say in how these events went and, um, so forth. So, which is great because you you have to have that sort of guidance and leadership. And here is an image from the 2019 D Web Camp, where you'll see Wendy on the right standing up, greeting people, leading a particular conversation, and so forth. And uh, there are definitely some luminaries within this this group. Um, I won't take the time to, to point out, but uh, trust me when I say that some of the people that are creating what is next are in this uh, photograph. So <clears throat> that's the, the camp director um, role and centralized model that we've pretty much been used to. What if, oops, uh, inadvertently click the link here. Um, so what if we had a different type of model, one that's property rights driven, one that's market driven, uh, one that basically the peers themselves can resolve their disputes. <clears throat> and the uh, seminal work that was done in this is was by a fellow named Ronald Coase, who I believe it was in 1959, was commissioned by the Federal Communications Commission 
to advise them on economic approaches to sorting out uh, disputes involving radio spectrum. And because what was happening is uh, there, there were radio stations that were broadcasting on certain frequencies and then somebody else would encroach upon their frequency and it became a big problem. And uh, Professor Coase basically came up with this uh, method of sorting out um, the rights to, to radio spectrum without necessarily being concerned with who might have had the rights prior to the dispute resolution. And he had some, some particular uh, constraints around this regarding how much does it cost to come to the, the settlement and you know, are the property rights well-defined and um, you know, the relative information of the, the parties and so forth. <clears throat> However, um, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1991 for his work in this. And this has become a very, very interesting um, approach to dispute resolution, asset allocation, um, market uh, settlement between peers. And I think it's it is time that this particular approach is um, looked at in a closer fashion. And part of the reason that I think that now is the time to look at this construct is because I think that blockchain and uh, some of the decentralized technologies that we're working on could actually enhance some of the fundamental prerequisites for uh, COSIAN uh, settlement and COSIAN dispute resolution in terms of reducing transaction costs and speed and, and bringing um, parties together on a peer-to-peer -to -peer basis that can come to a settlement between themselves without involving some sort of uh, third party uh, arbitrator or court or judge or so forth. So um, that is part of what we're looking at this evening. Here is an article from Wikipedia that I recommend you take a look at. This is just the beginning of the article talking about Coase theorem. And towards the end of the article, they talk about some of the fundamental assumptions and prerequisites for Coase theorem to work as you know, outlined by, by Professor Coase, and also talks about some of the real life um, sort of friction points that have been in the way of Coase theorem actually being implemented. So that's what we're talking about. Now, in addition, this is a podcast, fairly recent podcast from August 23rd, 2021, by two law professors talking about property rights, how we generally assign property rights. They wrote a book called Mine, and they definitely involve uh, Ronald Coase's theorems and assignment of property rights, as you can see towards the bottom of the paragraph, the description. And then on the right, you can also see a couple other Econ Talk podcasts that talk about Coase theorem and some of the um, implications and profound, they, these podcasts, these three podcasts go into the profound nature of this um, theorem by Professor Coase. So I highly recommend that you take a look at this. And here is one of my favorite, very short talks about the power of market forces by another Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman, where he, he does uh, an illustration in his own words. He didn't actually come up with this model, but it's called uh, Eye Pencil. And I highly recommend you watch this. It's about two minutes, two and a half minutes. And... Uh, Dr. Friedman talks about the power of market forces in sort of a decentralized manner. And what I really like about this is that he concludes this very short talk 
with uh, comments on how market forces can actually be a fundamental foundation for bringing uh, otherwise um, adversarial groups to that might be mortal enemies outside of a market construct, it actually can bring them together for some sort of productive um, endeavor and, and actually be fostering um, peace in the world. So that um, is also leads me into this, which is a presentation that I did when I was working in the telecommunications realm and the telecoms were wrestling with a problem that they um, were, were really trying to solve regarding taking telephone numbering and moving it into the contemporary and giving it functionality that was would be akin to internet domains. And it never succeeded. And part of it was because the governance of this construct could not be settled among the telecoms and the regulatory authorities and the other interested parties. So that uh, instead of telephone numbers being this uh, antiquated dinosaur that we have today, telephone numbering actually might be as good or better than internet domains. So I won't go through this presentation, but you do have a working link to the presentation. And um, it, it touches upon some of the market dynamics, some of the issues that are currently confronting decentralized identity. So I have uh, spent many, many years um, working in this area and trying to um, usher in a new realm for telephone numbering such that it, it could blossom into a much more functional um, realm. And when you think about it, we use telephone numbers as an identifier. So many of us use, or, or many of, many of the, the ways we interact with one another, we use our email address as basically our representation of our identity. But we also use our telephone numbers as a representation of our identity. Many of us have probably gone to the supermarket and um, we have been invited to put in our telephone number for our um, identity there at the supermarket so we can you know, get discounts and, and basically um, get other services related to our shopping habits and so forth. But um, telephone numbering has really not, um, in my view, come close to being the equivalent of an email address, even though it could be. Um, I mean, as good as an email address and, and probably better. So um, anyway, I won't go into too much, but I invite you to take a look at this presentation. And I can assure you that there were some very interested folks that were um, did a lot of work, years and years of work on this to make uh, telephone number-like addresses operate on par with something like an email address or um, internet domain and so forth. And there was one tech entity that participated in this particular session, which I call the, the funeral of Enum um, on September 16th, 20, 2008, which basically the, the, the end user opt-in Enum was put to uh, rest at that point. But there was one very prominent technology company that was really upset that this, um, this initiative did not go forward. So um, along those lines, here is a presentation that I did along with um, a few other uh, team members for HackFS in uh, 2020. And you can watch this video, but um, in essence, we were proposing a, a directory whereby 
there could be something akin to um, like a telephone directory, but for the decentralized web. And uh, that I assert is still missing in our Web3 initiatives and blockchain and um, decentralized web and D-web and so forth. So this is a presentation that starts to talk about that. And uh, again, I'm hoping that this particular session this evening might be the spark of a conversation when we do gather at D-Web Camp 2022 in late August for some of the, the, the folks that are there to continue this conversation and see if we can collectively come up with uh, an approach and a path that would actually be viable and could actually be impl implemented, prototyped and so forth. And um, <clears throat> fortunately over the last two years or year and a half since this was created, I've boosted my technical skills and I am starting to work on a um, prototype uh, in, in collaboration with some of the other team members um, that were originally with me at uh, HackFS. So, and here is um, one of the pages from our presentation that talks about the directory architecture, um, basically keeping it as simple as possible, using a lookup number that could spell phrases. So it's both human friendly as well as machine friendly. And then um, the public key is controlled by the user. It creates a trusted and transparent directory that is decentralized and um, could utilize some of the D-Web uh, constructs and uh, innovative methods of file storage and so forth like IPFS and Filecoin and uh, could also incorporate some registrar services similar to DNS, but um, could also provide a marketplace for uh, lookup numbers that would uh, migrate those lookup numbers based upon what they spell or their, their repeating digits could migrate to the highest and best users. And keeping in mind that I think this could be structured so that it's Swiss neutral, non-proprietary um, for trust and permanence, because um, particularly in the D-Web space and the folks that will be attending D-Web camp, um, we are very um, leery of anything that is not, um, or that, it, that that is centralized. And um, the recent, uh, attempt or purchase of Twitter has um, highlighted that concern. So um, here is kind of drifting into how could this directory be used? And I uh, recommend you take a look at this uh, really cool device, which is called a Jetson. And it is a, um, like a drone that you can fly yourself and cost about a hundred thousand dollars. And they, they're starting to sell them um, through the company that, that makes these. But um, it, as you watch this video and you watch this person fly around in fields, just sort of freestyle, um, what came to my mind was, well, who's gonna be the air tra traffic controller for these devices? I mean, this is really, really cool, and I could see it operating in cities, but you can't have everybody just sort of freestyling, and um, I don't think you can, it's going to work to have like an air traffic controller of these uh, devices, and this goes beyond the, the a device like this that's actually uh, carrying a human. A, a big, big topic is delivery drones. Who's going to coordinate those? How do you do that? And one of the professors at Arizona State University, uh, Troy Rule, has done some extensive work on how do you uh, create pathways and routes for delivery drones? How do you navigate property rights? How do you 
create a market for basically the drone that has the highest and best use for that particular route to have priority over that route. And there was also a um, presentation from, um, let's see, I've got his card behind me. Anyway, uh, another um, scholar from the Mercata Institute of, uh, I think, George Mason University, talking about the very same topic. So I put this image in the presentation because I think if there was a Swiss neutral, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized public key directory, things like controlling or being an air traffic controller to direct things like these um, flyable drones by human beings and delivery drones, as well as autonomous vehicles, as well as um, the internet of things, many, many things could start to be coordinated if we had this global ubiquitous Swiss neutral public key directory. So that's the purpose of this particular image. Another key consideration in my view is this article that just came out, uh, I think on the 15th of June. But this talks about how Russia is uh, actually taking over the Ukraine's internet. And they have been able to, the Russian powers that be have been able to um, commandeer many of the Ukrainian internet IP addresses and so forth. So I recommend you take a look at this. And I also recommend that you look at the Ukrainian conflict as sort of a, um, a, an example of some of the conflicts that we could be facing globally in the event of a global con, uh, confrontation or conflict. Because um, this is this desire to control the communication networks is one of the first pieces of any sort of military operation. And if we had a global ubiquitous Swiss neutral um, public key directory, I think that could go a long way towards um, assuring us that we could continue our communications and our coordination and uh, other essential constructs of both peace as well as safety and cybersecurity. I think this is another dimension of why this particular topic is uh, so important and critical. So this is a little bit about me. Um, here's how you can connect with me. And I'm going to stop the screen share and basically open it up for a little conversation. All right. So any comments? Um, I don't see any comments in the chat section of the YouTube um, page here. And by the way, if you're watching this, um, you should check out the show more underneath this recording because there's a whole bunch of links to this presentation as well as this meetup and uh, DWebCamp and so forth. So um, that's, that's a resource for you. And again, there's probably, uh, there will probably be other um, talks and, and uh, talking about this. So uh, go ahead, Michelle. Hey, uh, I'm hiking, so I'm off camera, but um, I was wondering if you could summarize the coast model that you talked about early on. No, I'm not familiar with economic theory or anything at all. So sure, I didn't really follow. Okay. So here's a summary of the coast um, theorem. And one of the examples is a farmer and a railroad. So 
let's assume that there's a farmer who's growing wheat, which you know uh, could catch on fire if there are sparks emanating from the railroad or the trains that use the railroad tracks that go through the farmer's land. And let's assume that there's not a prior right to either burn down the farmer's crop or uh, a, a mandate for the train to spend the money that um, would be required to put, let's say, uh, spark guards on the trains and so forth to uh, reduce or eliminate the cost that might uh, be borne by the farmer who's growing wheat and so forth. So Kosian theorem says that, you know, in this situation, we've got clear property rights. The railroad owns the train tracks and the train, and the farmer clearly owns the wheat fields that might catch on fire as the train passes through the wheat field. So who's going to, um, who's, how's this problem going to be settled? The train, the railroad doesn't wanna spend the money to mitigate the sparks from the train. The farmer doesn't want to lose crops based upon the fires that can be started uh, from the train that moves through the, the wheat field. So how does this get decided? Well, Kosian theorem says that if the transaction costs are low enough, if the farmer can negotiate with the railroad and vice versa, one of the two will either pay the other one to make the improvement or pay for themselves, so in, so in other words, um, the farmer might pay for fencing or some sort of fire retardant along the railroad track or uh, might come to a, an agreement with the railroad to say, okay, I'll pay you X amount of money to um, put fire guards on your railroad cars and so forth. So if there is a, a way for these two parties that have uh, competing interests and, and different and adversarial interests in who bears the cost of this. Coase theorem says that they will come to an agreement that basically uh, optimizes the solution and will provide the solution to one of those two entities that economically is providing the highest and best use. So um, that in, a, in essence is how Coase theorem works. And we see this actually in kind of a, um, a, a less than ideal situation in my view, when parties come to agreement out of court before going to trial, um, they will often, you know, through their attorneys, uh, come to some sort of settlement that's based upon usually some sort of monetary amount where one party pays the other party to, to settle the case instead of going through and enduring the high transaction costs of bringing a case to trial and um, you know settling it by a, either a judge or a jury or both, um, where you're basically trusting some sort of independent, uh, theoretically independent, um, neutral third party to adjudicate the, the conflict, the dispute resolution between these two parties, the railroad and the farmer. Now, I think there's big flaws in that. Um, A, I think Professor Coase was correct that there's huge transaction costs whenever you bring some sort of uh, litigation to uh, to try to resolve some sort of conflict like this. Um, and B, I think it is um, somewhat of a, an illusion to think that the, um, the process is going to 
result in some sort of um, fair and equitable outcome. Why do I say that? Well, the reason I say that is because the two parties, and believe me, this is nothing disparaging on the legal system because the legal system is a great system, but um, the, it's, it's based upon the premise that you're going to have a neutral disinterested um, party resolve the matter for these two conflicting or competing parties that can't resolve the matter among themselves. Why do I think that is, um, has a serious flaw that most people don't appreciate? And um, I'm somewhat speaking from experience. <clears throat> the flaw is that the entity um, deciding the case, um, A, doesn't have skin in the game, B, doesn't have the local knowledge that the two competing parties have, and um, C, is trying to get their arms around or understand the nuances of the case. And I think that is um, that is a the the Kosian model where if Jay's the farmer and uh, Southern Pacific Railroad is the railroad, we know what our needs, what our values are, what our costs are, and so forth. And it's much better if the two parties can come to some sort of um, resolution themselves rather than turning it over to a third party to try to decide the case, which is much slower, much more costly, and far less efficient in terms of the knowledge that um, the two parties have themselves regarding the, the details and the nuances of the case. So <clears throat> Michelle, I hope that um, sort of demonstrates in, in a understandable way how uh, Coast Theorem works. Um, there's other examples of a, uh, some, a candy maker and um, let's say a dentist or a lawyer having uh, an office, offices and their factories next to each other and um, the candy maker is disturbing the lawyer or the dentist or the uh, the doctor, they will come to some sort of resolution. Um, so if I if I could drone on just a little bit as to why I think this is um, ideal for blockchain, because blockchain does offer a um, a transparent economic platform where um, knowledge, interaction, connectivity between the peers uh, can happen in what I consider to be a more efficient manner. So I think Coast Theorem is still uh, has a lot to be, um, a lot of innovation that could be applied to it, particularly in using blockchain and decentralized constructs. And part of the, the intention of this particular presentation is to start to explore, okay, how could we utilize some of these um, distributed ledger technologies to facilitate transactions that are effectively dispute resolutions or asset allocation methods in competing um, uh, adversarial constructs and so forth. So that's a long-winded answer, Michelle, to your question, but um, does that give you a little better idea of uh, Cosian theorem? It does. Thank you. That gives me a, a, I really didn't have any, you know, sort of basis to know what you were talking about. And that helps a lot. Thank you. Cool. Professor Marchant. Yeah. So, I mean, just continuing on with what you're talking about. I mean, the, the practical app implications of cosine theory is pretty limited because of transaction costs being so high. But as you say, this idea of a distributed ledger or blockchain could greatly bring those down. And the example you discussed is a wonderful one of, of Troy Rule's proposal for drone delivery. So assuming it's a, it's trespassed to fly over private property, Amazon's going to be starting 
home deliveries with drones shortly. It looks like it might be trespassed to fly over a private property, at least a low enough level. So Amazon would have to negotiate with each landowner separately of what their price is for it to allow a drone to fly over their property. <clears throat> it might be different for different days of the week or different times of the day and so on. It would take forever. The transaction cost would just be absolutely enormous just for Phoenix alone to negotiate with every home landowner in Phoenix. But if uh, these landowners can put on the blockchain their price and then the, the drone operator, whether it's Amazon or Domino's or whoever it is, can then just look through that and plot its its, its route and uh, for its least cost, then you're essentially going to implement this at a, a fraction, a minute fraction of what the, the cost would have been with negotiation. And now Cosis Serum uh, can become operable because now we can get the most optimal solution because everyone has their price and, and, and including the deliveries of what they're willing to pay. So I think, you know, that drone example is a wonderful one of, um, of how, uh, you know, COSI and theory combined with blockchain can really help uh, lower these transaction costs and make these things feasible that otherwise wouldn't have been. So yes, that's right. Thank you. And, and if I could give, just kind of uh, illustrate an example of that, uh, Gary. So let's say that Jay's a landowner and, you know, I am fine with Amazon drones flying over my backyard, um, you know, even in a steady stream, if I'm getting some sort of compensation for it, you know, uh, after like, you know, eight o'clock at night or whatever, when I'm not out there, I'm in bed sleeping, they're not disturbing me, I've got my earplugs in and I'm incentivized to put earplugs in uh, because I'm getting X amount of money per month to allow the FedEx and the, all the various drones to fly over my property. Um, however, let's say that, you know, one of my, my daughter's getting married on a Saturday afternoon, and we're going to have the wedding in my backyard with this type of dispute resolution and market driven construct where the property rights are clearly defined. I could basically raise the price, uh, to a level that would give me quite a bit of, uh, assurance that the drones aren't going to be flying over just as the best man is giving my daughter and uh, my future son-in-law their um, their toast. Um, that's how this could dynamically work. And then let's say I'm going to go on vacation and I'm not even going to be at my home uh, during some time period. I could really lower the price and then all of a sudden I've got like this um, parade of drones, you know, traveling through my backyard because I don't care. And, uh, you know, effectively uh, Amazon, FedEx, the post office, all those drones are going to buy, uh, you know, my wife and myself a hotel night, you know, on our vacation, whatever. So I, I think it's important and one of the things that I really admire about Professor Coase is uh, one of his philosophies was, hey, whatever you, you know, write out on the blackboard in terms of economic theory doesn't mean anything. It's only when you put it into practice, only in real life do you actually start to test some of these economic theories and so forth. So does that make sense? Gary? Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, you know, um, Amazon doesn't want to have a discussion with you every time you're having a new event or something you don't, but this can all just be automated. You can just update your preferences on your blockchain site whenever you have a change and it's automatically registered. So again, it just greatly facilitates and makes possible this COSIN ideal of getting to the most efficient solution with very minimal transaction costs. So it's, it's really is blockchain and distributed ledger was made for COSIN negotiations. It's a perfect fit. So I'm glad you brought it up. And let's, I think it might be uh, valuable for us to contrast what we just talked about, where you've got this blockchain or decentralized uh, trust of the, you know, ledger of, um, you know, uh, uh, identifiers and 
public key security and so forth. Let's contrast it with the way it's going according to um, Professor Rule's uh, presentation, which I've seen a couple of times. The way it's going now is the delivery companies are making the case that they should actually have the right to, to cross over people's properties, that it's in the common good or the betterment of blah, 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 um, for them to just get sort of a carte blanche blanket right to, to have these drone deliveries. And they're starting to stand up these um, little quote sandboxes and so forth in small locations where they can um, basically use their um, lobbying power, uh, you know, power to negotiate at the regulatory level to get favorable air uh, rights for these devices. And let's say that they are able to achieve some sort of, you know, regulated uh, routes and so forth. That is not even close to being as dynamic as what we just articulated with the blockchain and the dynamic market uh, pricing that can accommodate, uh, you know, on a granular basis, Jay, Jay Carpenter's um, desire to host a wedding in his backyard on XYZ day um, and Jay Carpenter's desire to have the drones flying through his backyard when he's on vacation. So um, I, I think, you know, as we're talking about this, this is a really good example to hold up in a Kosian market dynamic property right model versus a more static uh, regulatory and uh, rulemaking model that is the tendency um, from the past because we didn't have this dynamic construct that could you know, effectively lower transaction costs. The transaction costs to do that were the, the, you know, the market-based approach were so high that the transaction costs to actually lobby the regulators and you know, the FAA and blah, 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 um, that was actually lower than, than putting in some sort of uh, solution that would have tried to you know, measure the dynamic nature of the market because we didn't have this decentralized construct. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, the, the legal regulatory approach, first of all, it's not working for these companies. They're not making much progress. And even if they do, it's, it's not a win-win situation like the, the rule proposal with the blockchain. You're going to have a lot of pissed off people if these drones are constantly flying over their property at 200 feet. And, uh, you know, there's pretty good precedent that, that that's trespassing. And so, you know, Jay's uncle Ned will be shooting down these, uh, Amazon drones with his shotgun if he doesn't like it, you know, if he gets annoyed by these and that, that's not good for anybody. So, you know, it's, it's just a conflicted situation because there's no efficient resolution. Whereas if we can use something like a blockchain to have a negotiated automated uh, agreement, it's win-win for everybody. Some people don't want any drones, fine. They won't fly over their property. Some people want to make some extra cash. It's great for them to be able to make some money by charging five cents every time a, uh, a drone flies over their house, particularly if they're away or if it's in the middle of the day when they're at work or whatever. So, I mean, it's it's a win-win, whereas the alternate solution is just more conflict. Well, the alternate solution is a lose-lose. Yeah. And it's probably more losers as well, because not only does the property uh, owner lose, not only does the delivery company lose because they've got to, you know, go through all the, the wrangling, the regulatory wrangling and so forth, but also... Um, Jay's uncle Ned, who uh, put away his shotgun, but is now in need of some sort of uh, delivery of medical um, drugs or whatever uh, that that could be, you know, life saving. He, in the centralized approach, he might not be able to get those drugs in time because there isn't this, you know, very efficient drone delivery service. Um, and I'm using kind of an, maybe an exaggerated example, but that that is another dimension of the loss. So, um, and, and by the way, uh, it's my understanding that the drones are being deployed in 
places like um, Africa and so forth to deliver like blood and, you know, essential medical services, that's something like 70% of their missions. Um, or I, I don't quote me on that, but it's some high percentage of their missions is actually the drones in um, regions that, that allow the drone deliveries. They're utilizing them for very important uh, services. Right. So, yeah. Any other uh, thoughts or questions before we wrap it up this evening? Well, I um, I hope that this session sparks some conversation, particularly for the folks that are, will be attending DWeb Camp 2022 on the August the 24th through the 28th. Um, I would also, again, um, yes, Michelle, go ahead. I was just wondering if there is a spot for that conversation. We, I know some of us use Element or are you thinking in person or how, how does that conversation? I, I think that's, I think that's a great point, and um, I I think we should open up a room in Element to continue this conversation. And uh, thank you for bringing that up. And by the way, that picture that I showed with Wendy Hanamura standing in the tent talking to all those people, the founders of Matrix and Element were sitting there right in the front row. So that's uh, quite appropriate. But um, yeah, I think we should definitely um, start the conversation and uh, let's say within a week I'll put a uh, link in the notes to this recording uh, to a channel in Element so that we can um, have a, a more dynamic conversation about this. Um, so and I would like to say again that we did a session earlier this year on what I consider to be premier um, events, three of them. One was GETS, um, DWeb Camp was another one, and then the Science of Blockchain Conference or Stanford Blockchain Conference. I would recommend you take a look at those if you want more information about these. But I would recommend that you um, put it in your calendar to attend the Governance of Emerging Technology and Science at um, Arizona State University, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, because all of the all of these items are are meshing together: the regulatory, the governance, the technology, the policy, the human uh, side of this, the economics, the business side of it. All of this stuff is um, coming together, and uh, you know these these three events uh, gets. Governance of Emerging Technology and Science, DWeb Camp 2022, and the Science of Blockchain Conference at Stanford University on August the 29th through the 31st. All of these I consider to be uh, instrumental in bringing together people that um, are, are passionate about these topics, that have the technical, the policymaking, the legal, um, all, the, all the disparate disciplines that are needed in order to stand up something that's working. Um, these are the events uh, to keep an eye on and to attend. So anyway, um, we will have another session on the fourth Wednesday of July. And then on the fourth August, uh, fourth Wednesday in August, we might actually do our uh, Desert Blockchain Monthly from the Web Camp 2022. So uh, we'll see if that happens. We also have on the second Saturday of each month here at this facility that you see behind me, an image of it, um, which is called Desert Blockchain Camp. We have an open house, so watch for that on Meetup as well. So again, we're completely community supported uh, via Patreon and becoming a Desert Blockchain citizen. We appreciate your support for $10 a month or uh, you know your contribution. And we are creating things to make that contribution uh, have uh, real value for you and um, go a, a step beyond just supporting uh, something that you're interested in. 
So with that, I will uh, conclude. And again, I thank uh, everybody who's watching this, who watches it in the future, and please feel free to contact me, Jay Carpenter at desertblockchain.com. All right. Thanks, Jay. All right. Have a good evening. Bye. Right.